Lord Scourge was born in the same era like characters such as Revan and Malak. He was a male Sith pureblood who had been trained on Dromund cars from a young age. We don't know of Scourge's parents, but he also never speaks of them so we can assume he broke those chains long ago. His birth name is also unknown and he only ever refers to himself as Scourge which is his chosen Sith name. After completing his training at the Academy and being named a Lord of the Sith, Scourge was sent to a recently conquered planet within the Outer Rim. After assisting in quelling some uprisings on the planet, Scourge was then sent back to Dromund Kars to meet with a member of the Sith Dark Council. When Scourge arrived on the Sith capital, he was escorted to Darth Nyrus, the council member he was due to speak with. Before arriving, Scourge and his escort were ambushed by mercenaries. Despite the mercenaries' hard work, Scourge was a Sith Lord and was in no mood for games. He quickly dispatches the threat and almost interrogates a name out of the enemy as to who hired them. After dealing with the threat, Scourge was escorted inside. The reason Scourge was sent to Drummond Cars was to investigate assassination attempts on Darth Nyrus. However, while speaking with Nyrus, Scourge learns that it wasn't her personally who requested his presence. It was the Emperor. You see, Darth Nyrus was making no progress on exposing whoever was behind the assassination attempts. The Emperor suggested she should bring in outside help, seeing as her own team wasn't getting the job done. A suggestion from the Emperor was basically a divine command. Scourge also learned that Nyrus herself hired the mercenaries to ambush Lord Scourge on his way here. She confessed if the mercenaries killed him, then he was too weak to serve her, and if he killed the mercenaries, they proved to be a waste of resources. The politics of Sith didn't come easily to Scourge. In fact, he hated politics, but perhaps that was a weakness. After all, in the current era, Sith gain rank and prestige by manipulating politics. Before the conversation with Nyrus began, Scourge was already suspecting members of her own team. Scourge realised he was still out of his depth when it came to the machinations of Sith manipulation and deceit. After the introductions, Scourge is placed on Nyrus's team to start helping with her own personal missions. You could call Scourge the paranoid type. He always questions the motives of those around him, especially those who worked under Nyrus. While on a mission with the team, new information was uncovered that finally gave a lead as to who is behind the attacks. However, Scourge had noticed that the team he was with seemed to show little regard for his life, which led Scourge to suspect them even more. While on the mission, Scourge suffered multiple injuries including broken ribs from having to defend himself against security droids, the same security droids Setchel was meant to have shut down. Setchel was the personal lackey of Nyrus, personal assistant if you will. He was Scourge's personal annoyance. Scourge knew he couldn't convince Nyrus of foul play, so he decided to just keep a close eye on Setchel and the others from now on. Darth Nyrus summoned Lord Scourge to her presence, and once he arrived, Nyrus lectured Lord Scourge about struggling against some security droids, but also she teaches him a new lesson. Nyrus explains to Scourge that he has a special gift. When a dark side user fights an enemy of flesh and blood, they feed off of their fear to fuel their own power and hatred. However, Scourge was able to amplify this much more than an ordinary Sith, but when Scourge fought the droid, he couldn't feed off of any fear from the droid, hence he forgot his training when facing such an opponent. Scourge didn't like being told what to do, but Nyrus had a point, so he heeded the lesson carefully and understood what it meant. Nyrus now had a new mission for Scourge and the team, including Setchel. The data that was recovered recently revealed that a rebel house on an Imperial planet orchestrated the attacks on Nyrus in their efforts of freeing the people from tyranny and the Sith Empire. When Lord Scourge and the team arrived at the location, pure-blooded Sith ordered the team to stay behind while he takes out the cameras and guards. Scourge laid waste to more than 20 poorly trained soldiers who now rested in different shapes and sizes around the room. Scourge's team had disobeyed the order to wait and had gone inside to retrieve potentially important data. Scourge was furious that his orders had been disobeyed, especially by Setchel. 
he was ready to punish them for their insubordination when Settle revealed that a Dark Council member had actually had a hand in the attacks. In fact, Setchell had uncovered that it was Darth Zedrix, the Dark Council's longest serving member who assisted the Rebel House. A hollow call recording was found of Darth Zedrix speaking of defying the Emperor and stopping his plans. A revelation like this was big news. Scourge needed to report back to Darth Nyrus. When Darth Nyrus heard the news of Darth Zedrix's betrayal, she told Scourge that they would not report this to the Emperor. This made Scourge feel very uneasy. Defying the Emperor was not something anyone would recommend, but Nyrus wanted to deal with the situation quietly. She also didn't want to risk the Emperor murdering them all in an effort to save time. Seeing an opportunity to take out a rival Dark Council member was quite striking to Nyrus, but an assault on his stronghold would be too public. It would run the risk of people finding out about the feud, which could lead to the Emperor intervening. This needed to be dealt with quietly. Setchel suggested an ambush. He could duplicate the same signal used for his holocall to transmit a message for a private meeting. If Cedrix took the bait, they could do to him what he was trying to do with Nyrus, assassinate him. Nyrus looks in the direction of Scourge and asks him if he's up to the task. While still being uneasy about the situation, Scourge accepted the mission. The chance to fight and kill a Dark Council member would be a great achievement for Scourge, and since Zedrix was a traitor to the Emperor, he would potentially be praised for doing it. After meticulously planning the ambush, Darth Zedrix takes the bait and arrives at the meeting location, but it was Lord Scourge that was there waiting for him. As expected, the Dark Council member had not come alone. He was escorted by two human Sith acolytes. Scourge waited by his hiding spot for the traitor to walk by. Then, he lunged out and almost killed the Dark Council member with one blow. At the very last second, Zedrix had activated his lightsaber and parried the attack. The element of surprise was over, the Dark Council member backed away, and his two acolytes pressed forward towards Scourge. Both acolytes came at Scourge with a roaring fury of anger. Feeling their dark side energy rise, Lord Scourge manipulates the force to feed off of the acolytes hatred and use it against them. While they fought well, Scourge would be the victor here. His power in the use of the seven flight saber form Julia was just too much for the Acolytes to handle. Darth Zedrix addressed Scourge, saying he knew he works in Nyrus. Scourge stated that it was his honour and duty to kill him for betraying the will of the Emperor. Zedrix attempted to convince Scourge that Nyrus was playing him for a fool, manipulating him. Then suddenly, the pure-blooded Sith realised Zedrix was stalling so he could channel his own power, letting it swell inside so he could unleash a mighty arc of forced lightning at Scourge, who was engulfed in lightning, feeling a searing pain he had never experienced before. This was the power of a Dark Council member. Perhaps he was wrong to come here. Darth Zedrix explained to Scourge that Nyrus had sent him here to die, that he was a message. He could never defeat a Dark Council member who was being used for a game that went way over his head. Lord Scourge, despite the pain, was able to stand once again and face his enemy in the eye. Considering some of Scourge's own suspicions, what Zedrix had said made him stop and think for a moment. Scourge decided to probe his enemy with the Force to try and sense something underneath. He was confused by the news of Nyrus' potential betrayal, so he wanted to see if the council member was trying to lie. When peering underneath, Scourge sensed fear, desperation, and weakness, confirming that Darth Zedrix, as powerful as he was, was actually unable to deal a lethal blow to Scourge. The burst of lightning he displayed was the only reserve of power he had. Now, he was left with nothing. He was an old man, expiring. Scourge stepped forward, telling the old man he knows he's bluffing. Zedrix extended his lightsaber to defend himself, but Scourge simply smacks it away with his urn, sending the Dark Council member's weapon flying across the floor. Zedrix stumbled backwards to the floor, begging Scourge not to kill him, offering him anything he wants, even power. Scourge told Zedrix he could not give what he does not have. Scourge sliced his opponent in the chest and watched his body become limp on the ground. 
Darth Nyrus would want proof of his death, so Scourge knelt down, took a grasp of her, and then severed the former council member's head with his lightsaber. Lord Scourge was expected to report back to Nyrus straight after the kill, but much of what Zedric said had Scourge thinking. He was more than likely lying about Darth Nyrus, but the best lies are based on small truths. He wanted to question Setchel first, so he could determine whether or not he was being played by the Sith who rank higher than him. The pure-blooded Sith sneaks his way into Setchel's room in the middle of the night and grabs Setchel out of his bed while sleeping. The snivelling worm that Setchel was saw him screaming while Scourge loomed over him. He told him that if he cries out for help, he's dead. Now was the time for clear answers. Scourge interrogated Setchel about Nyrus. He even cut off two of his face tendrils to force him to answer quickly, as to not have time to think up a lie. After Setchel confesses that Zedrix wasn't behind the attacks, and that instead, Nyrus had orchestrated the entire thing to draw attention away from herself. Before Scourge could press for more answers, the door of the bedroom flew open. Darth Nyrus stood at the other side. He told Lord Scourge that all his questions would be answered, but if he should hurt Setchel again, she would end him. The two of them held a private conversation where Darth Nyrus explains to Scourge that she is part of a very secret cult within the Sith, who are set on bringing down the Emperor. Shocked at the revelation, Scourge didn't know how to react. He'd been played for a fool. Darth Nyrus further explained that the Emperor would soon attempt to start a war against the Republican Jedi. In this current era, Sith and Jedi have not fought each other for nearly 1,000 years. The last war was the Great Hyperspace War, which the Republican Jedi won. The Sith were pushed back to the Outer Rim. Going back for another war would just end in the same result. Besides, after their defeat at the hands of the Republic, the Sith were thought to be gone. Technically, they were all in hiding. Nyrus also told Scourge that the Emperor had long ago consumed the Force energy from hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, and that he would likely do the same thing again. The harsh weather and climate on Dromund Cars was the result of dark side practices by the Emperor, so the notion he could do something so drastic wasn't a crazy thought. However, Scourge was loyal to the Emperor and would need more convincing. Darth Nyrus agrees to take Lord Scourge to the planet where the Emperor consumed the Force, so he could see for himself what the Emperor had in store for his allies in the future. After a short hyperspace flight, Darth Nyrus and Lord Scourge enter wild space on the Outer Rim, the sector of the galaxy that housed the Emperor's former home world, Nathima. Upon entering the system, Scourge could only sense the faintest whisper of the Force. When they both landed on the surface of the planet, Scourge saw the truth behind Nyrus's words. The world was completely barren. There was no immediate sign of life in any direction, and when trying to reach out to the Force, all Scourge could sense was the void. Not being able to feel the Force translated into a feeling of discomfort and mental agony. The longer Scourge stood on the surface, the harsher the pain would become. Having no sense of the Force was like taking oxygen away. The Force was meant to be everywhere, part of everything, yet here, there was nothing. The realisation of the Emperor's true power level came crashing down on Scourge like a small pelco bug in the blistering rain. The running theory was, the Emperor consumed all life on this planet to fuel his own immortality. After all, he had already lived for over 1,000 years, and that was just what they knew of. What Nyrus was originally explaining was now clear to Scourge. The Emperor was a madman, addicted to power. If he could do this much damage to a whole planet on his own, Scourge didn't want to think about what the Emperor might do to him if he were to be caught as a traitor. Scourge told Nyrus that he'd seen enough. After bearing witness to the Emperor's destructive powers and listening to Nyrus' long story about the Emperor's history, Scourge agrees and joins Nyrus in finding a way to stop the Emperor. Just before leaving the system, Darth Nyrus spots another ship that just dropped out of hyperspace. Nyrus scanned the ship 
which didn't show up as anything she recognised. Without too much hesitation, Nyris fired on the ship immediately with her ion cannons. The shot was a direct hit, fries the systems of the ship, which results in it crashing downwards, into the gravity pull of Nafima. Scourge and Nyris follow the downed ship to where it crash landed. Scourge made his way carefully onto the ship and navigated the layout. He came across an unconscious human male in the cockpit. He had been knocked out on the crash landing. Scourge had no idea who the man was. He wore simple brown robes and had shoulder-length brown hair, with a black stubble on his cheeks. Then he sees the lightsaber on his hip. Lord Scourge takes the lightsaber and places it on his own belt, and he picks the man up and throws him over his shoulder, carrying him to Nyrus' ship. When he gets there, Scourge drops the man's body with no grace at all onto the floor of the ship. Before the pure-blooded Sith could tell Nyrus about the lightsaber he found, she spoke and said she knew this man. She said his name was Revan, that he is a Jedi and a Republic spy. Five years ago, Revan and another Jedi named Malak accidentally discovered Drummond cars. Before they could escape with the knowledge that the Sith Empire survives, they were executed by the Emperor. Scourge was confused as to how a Jedi executed by the Emperor could have survived or somehow escaped. Nyrus suggests that it stands to reason the Emperor allowed him to live and is possibly working with him right now. Based on this theory, they decide to take the Jedi Revan with them as a prisoner and to interrogate him on what he knows of the Emperor. Scourge was very much looking forward to his first time interrogating a Jedi. They tied Revan to a chair and drugged him with specific chemicals that wouldn't only make him feel drowsy, but also limit his capability of connecting to the Force. The drugs wouldn't cancel out any pain though. During the first session of interrogation, they only learned that the Jedi had lost a lot of his memories, so he wouldn't be much help in terms of new information, but he did share that he killed his friend Malak for reasons that are complicated. Darth Nyrus wanted answers to the important questions. How did Revan escape the dungeons and being executed? What was his relationship to the Emperor? And why was he on Nathema the same time they were there? The interrogations were not going well. As skilled as Scourge was with the art, the Jedi Revan was simply not breaking. Even though he was drugged, he could still call on the Force to help him resist the torture. Scourge knew interrogation could work, but he also knew if he pushed any harder, he risked killing the Jedi. Failed attempt after failed attempt led Scourge to tell Nyrus that Revan simply did not know the answers. His mind had been wiped somehow. Nyrus knew how. She knew that the Emperor was able to indoctrinate people, force them to be loyal. The Emperor was powerful enough to do this. It was possible that he lied about executing Revan, and that he possibly enslaved Revan's mind and sent him back to the Republic as a spy of some kind. Nyrus was now mostly interested in finding out how Revan was able to free his mind of the Emperor. They could sense he was not indoctrinated. Gage warned Nyrus that it could take years to learn what happened to Revan, to study him. Yet she had patience, just like the Emperor. The fact that the Emperor did this means there was credit to the story about the Emperor wanting to attack the Republic and Jedi again. This was something that was still off the table for the Sith right now. They just wasn't in a strong enough position to fight them in a full-scale war. And the last time they fought, the Republic thought they drove us to extinction. It was imperative that their existence was kept silent so that they had time to build their strength. This all gave vindication to Scourge. He knew he was going to do the right thing and stop the Emperor. Over the next few years, Lord Scourge stays within the service of Nyrus and is usually the only person to visit Revan now. In fact, he became somewhat obsessed with the Jedi. However, the relationship between them had somewhat changed. They still kept Revan drugged, so he couldn't escape. But it was possible to have a conversation with him at the right time, which Scourge and Revan did quite a lot over the years. Scourge never revealed his name to Revan, didn't want him to think they were friends. He was still his prisoner. But Scourge couldn't help but be in awe of Revan. He could sense his power in the Force. It was strong indeed, yet Scourge still managed to obtain some information from Revan. It wasn't much, but he learned that the Jedi Order had wiped his mind, and that Revan came to Nathima on a journey to discover his past and lost memories. What Scourge also discovered about Revan is that he was incredibly powerful. 
Even while drugged, he could sense his huge connection to the Force. Unlike the Sith or practical Jedi, Revan had experienced both sides of the Force, which Scourge thought made him more powerful. In some way, Scourge was no fool. He knew that if the Jedi had more warriors like Revan, then it was no wonder they lost the war against them nearly 1,000 years ago. It wasn't fear for the Jedi. It was respect. Knowing how strong your enemy was and knowing when to attack was all key to victory. Blindly attacking the Republic, Scourge's eyes, would lead to another overwhelming loss. He had to be on the side of preservation, a side that would have the Sith Empire survive. The Emperor had become a madman and needed a way to stop him. Darth Nyrus had previously suggested that they could infiltrate an elite organization within the Sith Citadel, servants or slaves that obey his every order without fail. Nyrus wants to find a way to break his hold of the Royal Guards so they could be convinced to help. Scourge didn't have much faith in that plan, but time would tell. What time told Scourge was that Nyris was complacent in their ultimate goal. Over the last few years, she had lost interest in Revan and seemingly forgotten about stopping the Emperor. When Scourge next visited Revan, the topic of defeating the Emperor was on the lips of each. Revan attempted to suggest that they could work together to take down the Emperor as allies with a mutual enemy. Scourge thought the idea to be a tragic attempt at gaining his own freedom, but Revan had also said that it didn't matter if Scourge wasn't convinced. Soon, he would understand. Pure-blooded Sith had no patience for Revan's game. He tried to tell Scourge that the Force had shown him a vision of sorts that showed Revan his freedom. As a dark side user, Scourge did not have access to such powers, at least not in the same way Revan did. Seeing visions of the future was a more light-attuned force power. Scourge told Revan that it was said Naga Sedal had visions of the Sith winning the Great Hyperspace War, but that didn't work out now, did it? Unconvinced, Lord Scourge ended Revan's social call early and carries on with his next task. Shortly after, the lackey of Darth Nyrus, Setchel, contacted Scourge to let him know that someone was trying to contact him and arrange a meeting. Setchel couldn't offer any more details other than the person who wanted to meet him wanted to meet alone. Lord Scourge was of course very skeptical of this and questioned Setchel further, but he had nothing more to tell. Even after Scourge gave his throat a quick squeeze through the force, the pure-blooded Sith accepted the invitation for a meeting but he wouldn't be going alone. Scourge arrived first at the meeting location, brought along Nyrus' best security team, led by a human named Mertog. It didn't take long for Scourge to sense the arriving presence of his mysterious contact. The pure-blooded Sith had set up a trap inside a cave with a dead end. When the stranger advanced through the cave, Mertog's team yelled some words, and suddenly, a little astromech droid accompanying the stranger lit up the room with a bright light. Scourge could hear a lightsaber and shots being fired. When the light finally dimmed, Scourge laid eyes on a human female holding a blue, double-bladed lightsaber. She was a Jedi. But why was a Jedi here in a Sith capital homeworld? The revelation shook Scourge to the core. She must have been here to rescue Revan. That was the only thing he could think of. Was Revan telling the truth after all? Had what he said about his vision been a warning to Scourge about this Jedi coming to free him? Or maybe it was more than that. Maybe she could also help defeat the Emperor. By the time Scourge put all this together, the Jedi had dispatched Mertog on his team. They both then engaged in a heated conversation about Revan. Mitra confirmed that she was here to rescue him, if necessary. After explaining the situation to the Jedi, including the whereabouts of Revan and the task of defeating the Emperor, they both decided to join a temporary alliance, but she wanted proof of his commitment to the cause of taking down the Emperor and freeing Revan. They both agreed to a new meeting place so Scourge had time to collect the evidence. He did so by visiting Setchel inside one of the clubs within Kars City. Setchel wasn't expecting to find Scourge ringing his buzzer at the club's private room, but when he opened the door, Scourge charged in and grabbed the pathetic Redskin by the throat. He told him, Make any sound louder than a whisper, and your life will end in unbearable agony. Scourge had to find out how long it would take Nyrus to find out Mertog is dead. If Scourge was to follow through with the plan, it would mean betraying Nyrus. So he had to figure out a time frame of when she would become wise to something going on. Setchel told Scourge he had about three days at best for Nyrus to notice the absence of Mertog. That means Scourge had to work fast, 
With just three days to get a plan in motion, the stakes were high. What Scourge had really come for was incriminating files about Darth Nyrus and the other Dark Council members who planned to betray the Emperor. He knew Setchel kept a record. It was a smart move to have a collection to use as leverage one day. Scourge was right, Setchel had the files he needed, but he warned Scourge about Nyrus having his head. But that wouldn't matter because the moment Scourge had the files, he grappled the tiny pureblood and snapped his neck while suspended mid-air. Scourge left the club while Setchel's warm corpse was still twitching on the floor. After his meeting with Setchel, Lord Scourge moved on to meet the Jedi once again. The next meeting location was in a similar place. When he arrived, he showed the data he stole from Setchel to the Jedi. I have what you need. The data would prove he was in fact working to stop the Emperor, and so were many other Sith within the Empire. However, Scourge and Revan seem to be the only ones actually willing to do it so far. While the little astromech droid and the accompanied Jedi went through the data, Scourge told the Jedi they had roughly two days before the window of opportunity closes to rescue Revan, that they needed to work fast. Once Nyris found out what happened with Mertog and Sedgel, she'll come looking for Scourge and it will all be over before it even begins. They're finally convincing the Jedi to essentially team up. The two decide to exchange names. The female Jedi was named Mitra. The pair begin to discuss their options of what to do next. The Jedi Mitra suggested that Scourge simply take her to Revan, then she would handle the escape. Scourge obviously found the idea amusing, considering the hundreds of acolytes and guards within Nyrus's stronghold. Scourge had suggested that they would need a distraction so they could rescue Revan while the guards are busy. The Jedi asked Scourge if he had a plan, and he responded with, I'm going to get the Emperor to help us. Scourge's plan was risky. He was going to personally request an audience with the Emperor and expose Nyrus and the other members of their secret cult. The Emperor had a strong enough will to take action against the traitors straight away, causing a great enough distraction for him and the Jedi to rescue Revan. However, that was if the plan actually worked. Convincing the Emperor of Nyrus's betrayal would be easy enough with the files he acquired from Setchel, but convincing the Emperor of his own innocence in this affair was truly the risky task. This meant Scourge had to lie in the presence of the Emperor. His life would be forfeit if he sensed any deceit at all from him. But this was the only way to get things done quickly. They needed to bust Revan out. So Scourge went ahead with the plan. Pure-blooded Sith made his way into the Emperor's Citadel. He was stopped by two guards who further directed him to a royal captain inside. Scourge had requested to see the Emperor, yet this wasn't allowed, except for Dark Council members. So the captain declared he must speak with a royal advisor instead. The pure-blooded Sith expressed the urgency of the situation and demanded an audience with the Emperor. The captain warned Scourge that if he was wasting their time, he would be punished. Scourge pressed on and the captain relented. The royal captain then escorted Scourge down the halls to the Emperor's throne room. The pure-blooded Sith made sure to take a mental note of the pathway they took, as he may need to refer to it later when they eventually make their own assault on the Emperor. Scourge entered the throne room and walked slowly down its center pathway. For a moment he worried that the Emperor would be able to sense the truth of his thoughts, but he reminded himself the Emperor is not all-seeing. If he had been, he would have already known of Nyrus's betrayal. As he walked, Scourge saw the Emperor's throne at the far end of the room. As he grew closer, the throne swiveled around to face him, and for the first time in his life, Lord Scourge laid eyes upon the Emperor. He saw an unremarkable figure clad in dark robes. The Emperor rose to his feet as Scourge arrived at the throne. He kneeled before his Emperor as he stood and said to Scourge, Rise, Lord Scourge. Scourge quickly explained to the Emperor the plot against him and exposed all of those involved, including Darth Nyrus. One of the Emperor's servants were summoned to retrieve the data disks that Scourge brought with him, and they were also going to place him into custody until the matter was dealt with. But Scourge couldn't be locked up and waiting around. He told the Emperor that if he didn't return to Nyrus, then she would grow suspicious and potentially escape. The pure-blooded Sith was playing a dangerous game. He was attempting to manipulate the Emperor, Fortunately for Scourge, 
this time it worked. The Emperor told Scourge he was brave to speak to him in this way, and that he would reward the initiative. He declared Lord Scourge next in line for Nyrus' seat on the Dark Council, which the pure-blooded Sith gracefully thanked the Emperor and bowed before him. The Emperor then spoke and said, If your information proves false, however, you will suffer a fate more terrible than anything you can imagine. For a brief moment, as Scourge looked into the Emperor's eyes, the Emperor showed him a glimpse of his true self, touching him slightly with the Force. The sensation that hit Scourge was like a horrific agony. He fell to the floor, shaking and murmuring like a child, his mind rapidly experiencing horrors Scourge had never imagined. And then the moment ended as he regained his footing. He saw the Emperor had already returned to his throne, and the royal captain escorted Scourge to the foot of the citadel. Before leaving, Scourge confirmed with the royal captain that Nyrus and her staff would all be purged by the Imperial Guard for treason. This was going to serve as the distraction they needed. The captain added that the attack would be soon, and that Scourge should stay out of the way but for now, return to Nyrus. The next phase of the plan was to get the Jedi Mitra inside Nyrus' stronghold to help rescue Revan when the time was right, but they pretend that she was a new slave for Scourge to get her inside. The plan in disguise was enough to get past the front guard back at Nyrus' stronghold, but the guard had told Scourge Nyrus was asking about him. This was bad news. This meant she was getting suspicious about Setchel and Murtog going missing when they were actually both dead. The Jedi Mitra exclaimed to just take her to Revan already, but Scourge knew that was too risky right now. As the two were talking about what to do, several loud explosions went off around the stronghold. The Emperor's guard had already mobilized and started their assault on Nyrus. They were using artillery to break down the outer walls. This was the moment they were waiting for. This was the plan. They both moved into action and headed towards Revan's prison cell. When they got to the cell in the dungeons, they saw Revan had already somehow convinced the guards to let him out so he could help escape in the attack. Now that they were finally reunited, Revan learned Scourge's name and made a joke about not being surprised why he didn't tell him in the first place. It was a terrible name. Before leaving the dungeon, Scourge stabbed Revan with a drug that would help him wake up, so to speak. The female Jedi Mitra also gave him something. It was his mask. When Revan held it, he fell unconscious to the floor. At the same time, Darth Nyrus showed up down the hall. She saw Scourge helping Revan, and she saw the female Jedi, quickly putting together the fact it was Scourge that betrayed her. She began attacking them with a shower of purple lightning. Despite their combined efforts, the Jedi and Scourge could not overpower Darth Nyrus. She was old, but that didn't stop her. Just as Nyrus was about to land a killing blow against Scourge and the others, Revan jumped into the chaos, wearing his robes and mask. He told Nyrus, I am Revan Reborn, and before me, you are nothing. Revan was able to completely redirect Nyrus's Force Lightning attack, which returned to her and completely overwhelmed her, until she was nothing more but charred ash, smoldering on the permacrete floor. Scourge rose to his feet after the battle ended. He couldn't determine if Revan looked more intimidating and powerful. Now he wore a faceless mask. Perhaps that was just because he witnessed Revan, single-handedly overpowered Darth Nyrus. The reason didn't matter to Scourge, but he was more confident than ever that Revan would be the one to help him stop the Emperor. Scourge gave Revan his green lightsaber back, and Scourge continued to get both of them out of the stronghold. Together, the three returned to the last cave used as a meeting place. Scourge didn't immediately go inside with them though. He decided to go to Kars City instead so he could retrieve supplies, also possibly find out if the Emperor stretched his military too thin. Right now it could be the best time to strike while his Imperial Guard are deployed. After learning what he could and getting the supplies they needed, he headed back to the cave. When Scourge arrived, he saw Revan and Mitra watching a hollow vid, but Revan didn't seem too keen to discuss the details around who was in the hollow vid. Scourge knew they were allies and not friends, so he pressed the matter no further. Besides, Friends were a liability to Scourge, he was a Sith Lord. He explained to the two Jedi that the Emperor had not only killed the five Dark Council members involved in the betrayal, but in fact, he had killed all 12 members of the Dark Council to send a message to the Empire. Within one day, the Emperor had assaulted three strongholds, including Darth Nyrus's, and then summoned the remaining nine for an audience at the Citadel. None of them left alive. 
The news went further than this though. Because of the sudden loss of the Dark Council, the Empire moved into chaos with people scared for their lives. The Emperor had imposed a curfew and sanctioned armed platoons to roam the capital. The planet was effectively under martial law. No communication from Offworld and no ships were permitted to land or leave. Together, the three of them discussed various things including Revan's past since he now somehow remembered everything since he touched the mask. Revan had confirmed that he saw inside the Emperor's mind. He saw that invading the Republic was the first step of his plan. He wanted to consume all life in the galaxy. His end goal was to eliminate everything so it couldn't threaten his power. Scourge also confirmed this when he mentioned the Emperor touched his mind too when he was in the throne room. During the discussion, it was mentioned that the Republic was currently vulnerable. This had been a few weeks ago. Scourge might have changed sides straight away if he thought the Emperor could actually win in an invasion against the Republic. But things had changed in a few weeks. Scourge knew that defeating the Emperor had to be done urging his entire Dark Council and consuming the entire Sith Armada on Nathima was sign enough of the Emperor's insane conviction. The pure-blooded Sith remained committed to the cause. The next plan of action would be to wait until the next day. While the female Jedi lay asleep and Revan was distracted watching the hollow vid again in the cave, Scourge was restless and decides to take the time to meditate. While connecting to the Force, Scourge suddenly saw Revan and Mitra laying lifeless on the floor of the Emperor's throne room. Scourge was there too, with broken and mangled limbs crawling towards the throne room door. The Emperor approaches him and covers his forehead with his hand. The pure-blooded Sith snaps back to reality, with sweat dripping from his head. At first, Scourge thought this could have been a dream or nightmare, but it was too vivid. The Force had given Scourge a vision of his own death, along with Revan and Mitra. It showed him the mission they so desperately needed to succeed end in failure. Scourge wanted to warn the Jedi about this, but he dismissed the thought of telling them something they might not believe. He struggled with what he had seen, but he knew the best way to understand it was to question Revan about the Force. Scourge asked Revan about the vision he had while in Nyrus's dungeons. Revan actually confessed he was bluffing and trying to somehow manipulate Scourge into believing they would work together. Despite that, Scourge learned from Revan that visions are intense and usually the details don't fade. This basically confirmed for Scourge that what he saw really was a vision. But Revan had also told him that the Force only shows you one of many possible futures. They come to you to help guide you toward the right path. Scourge took from this lesson that the vision he saw was not absolute. The next day, the three leave the cave together to embark on their ultimate goal defeat the Emperor. They could not use a speeder to directly approach the Citadel, so they had to make their way partly on foot, which was no problem since the streets were mostly empty due to curfew. When they arrive at the entrance to the Emperor's Citadel, the door bursts open and the Royal Guard surrounds the trio. Scourge quickly took action and told the guards, My name is Lord Scourge, and I demand a meeting with the Emperor. After convincing the guards he needed an audience with the Emperor, they partly agreed and escorted them to the throne room entrance where the royal captain would decide if they could really enter. Unfortunately, the trio had run out of luck. A smooth entrance was about to become a messy one. The royal captain recognises Revan from his previous visits to Drummond Cars and immediately connects the dots as to what is happening. With their cover blown, Revan began to fight by kicking one of the guards clear of the throne room entrance. All three assault the royal guards together, which of course were formidable and are not killed so easily. After killing a few of the guards, the trio back up into the throne room and slam the door shut. The Emperor watched them as they fight with the remaining few guards that followed them in. Scourge was fighting with the Royal Captain, who had managed to land a blow to Scourge's right shoulder with an Electra staff, forcing the pure-blooded Sith to use his left hand for the duration. Scourge was distracted in the moment by the vision he had of them all lying within death's reach in the throne room. He came to his senses and knocked the Captain to her back. When she crawled over to her weapon, Scourge met her there and slammed his boot down onto her hand. He drinks in the fear of his victim and then 
decapitates her. Mitra had called to Scourge that they needed to help Revan, who had already charged the Emperor. Scourge could see the Emperor stood over Revan as he was about to swipe at him and end his life. Mitra intervened by hailing her lightsaber at the Emperor's weapon. The pure-blooded Sith realized that if she aimed for the Emperor rather than his saber, she could have landed a killing blow as he was caught completely off guard. Regardless, Scourge pressed forward and together the three of them stood before and to oppose the Emperor. I expected better from you, Lord Scourge. Right now, Scourge knew he was part of a pivotal moment in time. The next few moments would sway events in the galaxy for centuries. When suddenly the Force washed over Scourge, and the universe stopped moving, the Force rushed through his mind and showed him millions of possible futures. Futures where they win in the throne room and futures where they lose. Then Scourge snaps out of it, lost and confused in the moment. Scourge sees Revan and Mitra moving to engage the Emperor. He had to decide quickly on his next move. Then once again, the Force glazes his mind, showing him a powerful Jedi in the future that wasn't Revan or Mitra. The powerful Jedi was stood over the Emperor's lifeless body, and Scourge knew what he had to do. As time began to move normally again, he places his saber behind the female Jedi Mitra and ignites the blade. Mitra was dead instantly. A quick, clean death was the most mercy he could offer the Jedi right now. The Emperor seized the moment and attacked Revan with a storm of lightning. Lord Scourge kneeled before the Emperor as he said, Explain yourself. Scourge desperately attempted to convince the Emperor that the Jedi was working with Darth Nyrus and that he had to infiltrate their duo so he could bring them before the Emperor to face justice. In reality, Scourge had seen a new vision, one that would guide him down the path to the Emperor's destruction. If he was to convince the Emperor what he says is true, the Emperor suggested to Scourge that he perform the killing blow against Revan. The pure-blooded Sith approached Revan's unconscious body. He rips away his mask and sees the burnt and scarred skin underneath. He then raises his lightsaber and brings it down for the finishing blow. However, Scourge's blade was stopped by the power of the Emperor. The fact he was about to do it was enough vindication for the Emperor. He also had other plans for Revan over the next few centuries. He was placed into a prison that even Scourge didn't know was located. In fact, the whole charade was enough to force the Emperor into reconsidering his invasion of the Republic, which was a small victory Scourge was willing to accept for now, seeing as Scourge had convinced the Emperor of his innocence. As a reward, so to speak, the Emperor brought Scourge into his personal research facility, where he would perform a dark side ritual to grant Lord Scourge immortality. This was Scourge's reward for being loyal to the Emperor which was actually the complete opposite of what he really was. The mighty Emperor bestowed upon Scourge the position of the Emperor's wrath, a role and title that would carry the full weight of the Emperor's might. He would be sent to destroy those who would dare oppose the Emperor's designs. The immortality granted to Lord Scourge came with a heavy price. After the ritual was complete, he could feel his insides set ablaze. He couldn't help but weep in agony. Scourge looked at the Emperor and asked him when the pain would stop. As time passes, you will learn to accept and endure your suffering. He cried out only a question. Why? The Emperor told the pure-blooded Sith that everything has a cost, and this is the price of immortality. Lord Scourge would spend the next 300 years learning the strengths and weaknesses of the Emperor, all while awaiting his prophesied champion to make an appearance. In this time, Scourge had also become much more powerful and more wise, but still retained his threatening demeanor. His actual existence became a legend over the years, as his and the Emperor's appearances were not often. Scourge was mostly sent to discreetly handle specific tasks set out by the Emperor. Only Lord Scourge and a few others even had access to the Emperor's fortress, which would be heavily guarded and usually move around within Imperial space. The Dark Council of the current era had no direct contact with Scourge. In fact, even they were not sure of his existence. The most recent task set before Scourge was to eliminate a Dark Council traitor on Quesh. However, when he arrived, 
He unexpectedly ran into the Jedi he so long ago saw a vision of defeating the Emperor, convinced immediately that the time was drawing near to the Emperor's demise, Scourge departed the planet Quesh and made his master, the Emperor, aware of the new powerful Jedi's presence. While committed to the cause of defeating the Emperor, Scourge had to be careful and update the Emperor in small doses about this new threat. This would secure Scourge's position next to the Emperor no matter what, which was key to getting the new Jedi where they needed to be in the future. Eventually, the new Jedi hero proved their worth when they assaulted the Emperor's personal fortress along with a few Jedi Masters. However, the assault ended in failure and the Jedi were killed or mind dominated. The new Jedi hero was one of the few who were turned to the dark side. After a week or so of indoctrination, the Jedi managed to break free from the Emperor's control and fight their way to freedom. Before escaping the fortress, Scourge confronted the Jedi and explained the entire story to them about defeating the Emperor. He then pledged his alliance to them and asked to visit their Jedi Council so he could give them an information and how to defeat Darth Vishu. Scourge explained to the current Jedi Council that the Emperor had dominated the minds of some Jedi Masters that were part of the previous strike team. He would use them against the Republic in the current war that was raging on. While the Jedi hero went on missions to free the Jedi and aid the Republic in war, Lord Scourge was making preparations for the Jedi to be able to face the Emperor. When the time was right, he would personally escort them there. Once the Jedi hero was ready, they met with Lord Scourge on the planet Drummond Cars. Scourge had arranged safe passage for them and coordinates to a safe landing area. Currently, the Emperor resided in his dark throne room, which was different to the one from many years ago. The Jedi hero and Scourge battled their way to the Emperor. However, Scourge was separated from the group and the Jedi had to go on alone to face the Emperor. The next communication Scourge received was the Emperor had been defeated and that he was dead. However, Scourge could sense that he wasn't truly gone. Scourge had a bond with the Emperor and he did not feel that bond break. The Emperor still lived, but how and where was a mystery. For a time, the galaxy would know peace from the Emperor's reign as whispers and rumours make their way around that he was killed by a Jedi. Lord Scourge would often reflect on his past, thoughts of things he can no longer enjoy in life. The cost immortality demanded caused searing pain within Scourge, but he became numb to that a long time ago. Now he has no taste, no smell, and he even suggests he could be colorblind, all of which added to the final cost. A few years later, the Emperor returned in glorious fashion under the guise of Valkorion. However, Lord Scourge and the Jedi Kira Carson went missing after their appearance into the galaxy. What actually happened to them was that they tried to help from behind the scenes. They spent their time opposing the Emperor's ultimate true goal. Scourge knew that he had more backups in place. Contingency plan if you will. While the Jedi hero defeated Valkorion and his relentless children, Scourge and Kira were able to find the original body of Tenebra. That was the Emperor's true name. Lord Scourge and Kira together were able to locate this body by following the guidance of Revan who had materialized in this realm as a force ghost, as he had unfinished business to complete. When they found Tenebrae's body, the location of which wasn't revealed, together they destroyed it to assure the Emperor would never regain consciousness in that form. However, the body had a ritual inscribed on the flesh, and when destroyed, it activated, sending out force waves to dominate the minds of others around. Scourge and Kira were actually immune to such techniques due to previous encounters with the power. However, the Grand Master Satil Shan and some of her Jedi followers had joined Scourge and Kira to assist them, but they lacked the proper training to resist the Emperor's mind domination that burst out of his destroyed corpse. All of the Jedi fell victim to the inscribed ritual. Tenebrae's original consciousness began to regain itself, using the Jedi's minds as vessels slowly. He attempted to take them over until he could once again roam the galaxy. The Jedi hero Revan, Mitra, Lord Scourge, and many others all joined forces against Tenebrae this time. Lord Scourge and the others defeat Tenebrae, once and for all. Lord Scourge had achieved his ultimate goal of defeating the Emperor and preserving not only the Sith Empire, but the whole galaxy. Across his entire journey, Scourge didn't once betray his dark side origin, who was a Sith at heart, 
and a Sith in spirit, but he didn't let that stop him from growing as a person in a big universe. He battled alongside many, and also against many. The last we heard, Scourge still travels as a companion with the Jedi hero, awaiting his next great mission, or possibly just enjoying the only kind of peace he will ever tolerate. Peace from the Emperor. Thank you very much for listening to my Lord Scourge Explained video. This one took a really long time to put together, so I would appreciate if you would consider subscribing and liking the video. Let me know what you want to see next. Peace. You must realize you are